What's up, everybody? We're back. Another new episode of the Last Way Podcast. We dive into topics like ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, nerd stuff, and conspiracies. As always, thanks for listening. It means a whole lot to us. Check out our Facebook page, our Twitter, Patreon.com, which is a really nice, simple way for you to show some love for the show. We also have a new blog that's out right now. Um, There's all kinds of links to all of our social media stuff uh, on our Facebook page and throughout the the places that you can find us there's tons of stuff but our blog is blowing up um i think we had 12 or 1300 people in the last 30 days so that's pretty crazy but um yeah definitely check us out pretty much anywhere so today we're going over uh, a really cool list uh, some stuff that i started researching um haunted objects from around the world and uh, again one thing that i am super interesting is how inanimate objects can become affected by spirits hauntings or other incidents i mean how can a painting invoke fear of stories and of its characters moving uh, or its eyes seeming to follow you as you move around the room you you see that a lot Um, what spirits can be imbued in certain artifacts to give them life can a mirror open a doorway to the other side we're going to look at that and a lot more on these episodes this is definitely going to be at least a two-part episode series because there is so many so many items that i was coming across during research but this will be at least at least a two or three part series but i'm going to start this episode with something a little more close to home if you've watched the channel for any real length of time you know my fascination with the bell witch haunting It's right in my neck of the woods, and I can find connections in the story to parts of my own family in more than one way. So our first haunted item is dealing with that scenario. Um, It is the Bell Witch Family Bible, or the Bell Family Bible. And this Bible is said to belong to the infamous Bell family, who suffered at the hands of a witch or haunting of some malevolent force in the late 1800s. The Bible is still in the family, but kept locked away uh, most of the time. It was only brought to light during a TV show on the History Channel somewhere in the mid-2000s. And this is all by memory. I didn't look this up. I just remember seeing this. So it's got to be mid-2000s range. The show's premise followed a descendant who was trying to find a way to break the generational curse of the family that states the firstborn males would all die in horrible ways. Uh, The Bible was brought out on an episode and shown to renowned haunted item researcher and Ed and Lorraine Warren family member John Saffis. The small group sat around a table, unwrapping and unboxing the Bible. Upon opening the box, uh, things almost immediately started happening in the room. There were sounds, uh, there was scratching on the walls, knocking, uh, basically everything you could have (laughs) in in a situation of a haunting. Um, It all could have been wind, but everything only started once the Bible was on the table. John, John Zaffis, however, having been around haunted items for years, was unfazed and simply said that was pretty normal. As they began to flip through the pages, the activity increased, and eventually even a picture uh, fell off the wall behind them. Um, Again, he still seemed unfazed, which I thought was pretty crazy. Now, at this point, they thought it was best to return the Bible from where it came, which was back in the box, nice and safe. And now this could have all been drawn up for TV, But it was really interesting. I thought that was really a crazy scenario that they just brought the Bible out and everything started to go to crap. So again, it could have been drawn up for a TV show. You know, you never know nowadays. But the next item is one of those that just make you go, hell no, I'm not going to have this in my home. This item is called Hands Resist Him. And this is the title or the name of a painting showing a small boy next to a doll-like girl. A large pane of glass behind them with small hands pressed against the glass. This item popped up for sale in the 2000s online with a warning from the seller stating that during the night some of the figures or hands would disappear from the painting and the boy would sometimes be seen moving throughout the room where the painting was hung. To get even weirder, people who look at the painting tend to complain of feeling sick or uneasy and some say they can actually feel small hands grabbing at them. The even scarier part is the first gallery owner to display the piece, 
and the first art critic to review the work died within a year. So again, no thank you, you can keep it. Moving along, the next item is the Busby Death Chair. Uh, this is a seemingly not important item, it's just a bar chair. But in the summer of 1702, Thomas Busby strangled his father-in-law, Daniel A. Whitty, when he found A. Whitty sitting in, his, in Busby's favorite oak chair. Arrested and tried for murder, he was convicted, and before death, his final request was to, to enjoy a meal and a drink in his favorite chair one last time. So, as he sat at the pub, eating and drinking, Thomas spoke these words. May sudden death come to anyone who dare sit in my chair. The chair remained in the pub for centuries, and sure enough, anyone who happened to sit in the chair met their fate in an untimely manner. Eventually, the chair was given to the Thirsk Museum in Yorkshire, England, and the legend so pervasive at this point, the workers decided to hang the chair from the ceiling where it could be observed, but never, even by accident, could anyone sit in it ever again. So... <laughs> But I'm not sure how they found out that people were dying, but you think you would have noticed it, you know, before, you know, years and years and years went on. You know, anytime someone sits in there, they just die. It can't be that big of a town. <laughs> you know, rumors gotta start spreading somewhere. But, anyway, that's, that's our, that's that item. So, moving on. And I'm going through these fairly quickly. Like, this is not going to be a terribly long episode. But it is Thanksgiving, it's the holidays, so we are kind of crunched for time. But again, there's so much, so much to go through with these haunted item cases that I don't, I, this is one thing I don't, I don't think I'll ever run out of, of items to dip, to speak on. So, um, the next one, which would be, which would go great right beside the chair, is the Bassano vase, uh, allegedly made for a bride in the 15th century. Sadly, the young bride died that night while clutching the vase and vowing to seek her vengeance, which really needs more explanation than I was able to find. But sometimes just that's just where the story ends. Um, <laughs> I was really like, why is she clutching the vase? What happened? Um, again, I'm looking for research assistance if anyone's interested. Contact me literally anywhere, any of the social media sites. But anyway... Any family member who inherited the vase would go on to lose their lives in, again, untimely ways. The vase was finally hidden away, no one's sure who hid it away. But sadly, in 1988, it was uncovered and put up for sale. The vase was sold to a pharmacist who reportedly died three months later, as did the 37-year-old surgeon who owned it afterwards. The last owners were so desperate to rid themselves of it, they tossed it out of a window where it hit a policeman on the head and nearly killed him. The family refused to take the vase back, and the vase was allegedly reburied in a lead coffin, awaiting to be discovered again in an unknown location. So there's that. Again, not something you really want. This, uh, this next one is called The Woman from Lem. Discovered in 1878 in Lem, Cyprus, this pure limestone statue is to believe to be a believed to be a fertility goddess, but rather than blessing the beholder with life, the crude figure, which dates back to 3500 BC, allegedly brings a legacy of death to all who handle it. The bad luck began with the figure's first owner, Lord Elfont. Within a six-year period of Lord Elfont's possession of the idol, all seven members of his family supposedly died under mysterious circumstances. Subsequent owners also lost their kin until Sir Alan Biverbook, Biverbook possibly, decided to donate the so-called Goddess of Death to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh, where it is kept safe under glass to this day. So, again, all these items, like that's what's crazy is how does an item gain the ability to, to kill, you know, is it curses, is it... You know, black magic, you know, there's all these options, and again, tons of this stuff, just, it's pervasive. There's museums that, there's a traveling museum that has hundreds of items. Um, most people have heard of Zach Bagans from Ghost Adventures. He has a haunted museum. Uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren 
uh, very famous uh, paranormal investigators. They have one. So, I mean, this stuff is just everywhere. So, speaking of that, let's look at probably the best known haunted item these days. The Annabelle doll. In 1970, a woman purchased a raggedy, a large raggedy ant doll in a secondhand store as a Christmas present for her daughter, Donna. She was a nursing student in Hartford, Connecticut at that time. Soon, Donna and her roommate Angie found the doll standing and kneeling by itself, and fresh droplets of blood seemed to appear on the doll's body. As the unexplained phenomena increased, Donna consulted a medium who told her that the doll was possessed by the spirit of a young girl called Annabelle. But Annabelle's antics became more dangerous. Donna had to call on paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, who confirmed that a demon, not a young girl, possessed Donna's doll. To this day, Annabelle resides in a locked box in Lorraine Warren's basement museum of cursed objects, where she is best blessed twice, month, twice monthly by a priest. The doll, in my opinion, is far creepier than the one in the movies um, and it's only been shown a few times in public the the one in the movies is obviously clearly made to look scary but the fact that the other one is a, a harmless looking albeit you know vintagely scary raggedy and doll just makes it so much more terrifying um, one of the few times it was shown was brought out to Zach Bagans museum again from Ghost Adventures and it was put on display for an episode the episode was fairly uneventful, but the reverence for the doll was really clear. Uh, the handler, who carried it in a case, uh, stated that no one should, should touch the doll at any time. And any time he had to move the doll, he used thick, almost welding-type gloves to ensure that none of his skin contacted the doll. And that's just crazy. Again, there's you know, there's enough out there about Annabelle where I don't have to really dig into it too much, but obviously the movie... I don't know how many movies there are, two or three at this point, just from that doll's legend. But uh, the next item is more weird than scary. It's a 1893 copy of the book The Lady of the Lake by Sir Walter Scott. The Scott House Inn in Ocala, Florida has been known as a haunted inn for years now. However, a ghost hunting crew got an unsuspected hit during a visit. The crew moved to the attic loft and upon turning on a ceiling fan, <laughs> the dusty book came flying off of the fan and hit the lead hunter in the face. If that's not weird enough, once the crew left and returned home, the book ended up in the luggage of the person that it hit, and reportedly now finds its own way around the home, ending up in places like the fridge, behind cabinets, and even in trash cans. <laughs> so, that was a short one, and again, that was pretty interesting that it came flying off the fan. And supposedly ended up in the luggage. So it makes you think, did they take the book? Did the book mysteriously end up there? Are they just pushing for publicity? Who knows? But I thought that one was kind of interesting. You don't hear about, you know, books flying off of fans any. <laughs> so kind of, that one caught my eye for sure. Um, the last one for this episode, which again, there, there will be more episodes for sure. And I'll have more time to put into them. Um, again, it's holiday, holiday week, holiday weekend, so we're kind of pressed for time, uh, so I do apologize. This one is one I've definitely never heard about until I found it in some random articles uh, throughout research. The tall men bunk, bunk beds, which tall men is one word, not tall man, it's just a, a family name, I believe. But apparently these seemingly fine household items became increasingly threatening and terrifying. They even gained enough renown to be featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries at one point. The story goes like this. In 1980s, Alan and Debbie Tallman bought a bunk bed for their two kids at a second-hand shop. Man, it really makes you nervous. That's the second thing bought from a second-hand shop, from a, like a thrift store. <laughs> makes you a little nervous. Uh, from the first night they brought it home, it was very clear something was wrong with the bed. First, one of their sons who had rarely even gotten a cold fell horribly ill. The radio on the nightstand began turning on and off on its own. The youngest daughter claimed to see a witch standing over her on the bottom bunk. Um, doors moved, lights turned on and off, and this is only a taste of the strange happenings. Soon the family began hearing voices throughout the house, 
and this and other uh, spooky happenings carried on for nine months before they had enough. The Tallmans had the bunk beds destroyed, and the haunting stopped. Apparently, it was that easy. So, one thing we have learned today is that some of these items have to be kept, sealed off from the world, and kept secure. Some simply need to be destroyed, and that is the end of that. But all with different means of becoming haunted, um, whether it be dark entities, curses, rituals. I don't really know what I've gotten myself into with this line of stories and and haunted items and haunted objects. Uh, I do find it quite interesting, quite fascinating that these things are out there. I mean, I, again, this has got to be at least a three-part episode, and I'll probably do five or six items per episode. Um, I've heard stories of haunted African idols, um, haunted like watches and wristwear, you know, just jewelry. Of course, you got the heart, the Hope Diamond. Um, there's just this stuff is like again, it's just pervasive. It's everywhere. Um, whether it be intentionally done through curses, uh, black magic, horrible deaths, what have you. But this stuff is everywhere. So this should be a really fun series. I know I, I have, I start too many series probably. But, you know, what are you going to do? we got to come up with stories. We've got to make episodes. Uh, this whole podcast situation is done way, way more better. Way better than I expected it to. Um, I'm extremely thankful to everyone. Obviously, it is Thanksgiving, so very thankful to all the people that listen, um, the thousands of people that read the blog, and it's only started a month ago. So check us out again. There's links, you know, in different descriptions. There's links on the Facebook page. The Facebook page is probably the best way to stay in touch with whatever we've got going on. We have Twitter and Patreon and all that stuff. We also do a little bit with ExtraLife.org which is a really great charity, but the Facebook page really brings it all together. So check us out there, and that'll be a good way to stay in touch with everything. But that's all we've got for today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you on the next episode.